Hello, I think you'll like this case. It's a perfect example of why it's so important to do a comprehensive exam and consultation on just about every patient. I talked about this in a video a few weeks ago, the importance of the comprehensive exam and consultation. This individual ends up having veneers, a deep cleaning, an endodontics, and a crown on a lower molar tooth. How would you like to get CE credit while watching this training video? I know you would. Great news, you can do it. All you have to do is click the link in the description below at dentistrymasterclasses.com. It only costs $20 per month and right now you can join for 99 cents. Do not miss this deal of a lifetime. But so many times, if you're just doing toothache dentistry, you miss some things. I look at it like home remodeling. And before I remodel someone's kitchen, I would want to examine the whole house and see what the foundation's like. Do they have termites? Do they like the floor plan of the house? Are they planning on knocking out walls? What's the overall plan for the house? So we're sure that whatever we do uh, in the remodeling process fits the big picture. Teeth are the same way. I've had dentists say, well, I don't think my patient would go along with a comprehensive exam and consultation. That's just not true. In 40 years of doing this, I've, I don't know that I've ever had a patient say, I don't want a comprehensive exam and consultation. You must remember, most people's favorite topic is themselves. People want to know about themselves. So get in the habit of doing a comprehensive exam and consultation on every new patient. Before you clean their teeth, before you do anything except get them out of an emergency situation, if they're having pain like an abscess tooth, a broken tooth, go ahead and do something to make them comfortable. But I'm not going to put a crown on a single broken tooth until I've done a comprehensive exam to see if it fits into the entire plan. What if the person is unhappy with the cosmetics of their teeth and wants to veneer the teeth and lighten the shade? Well, if you've broken an upper bicuspid and the, the patient has a yellow tooth shade and you match that bicuspid crown to the existing shade of the teeth, it's not going to match the final veneer shade, which if you're doing enough teeth, that's eight to 10 on the upper arch, you're probably going to lighten the shade. So bottom line is I encourage you to get in the habit of doing a comprehensive exam and formal consultation on 99.9% .9 of your patients. So this gentleman presented in the office knowing he had a toothache on the lower left and he didn't like the cosmetics of his teeth. You see a lot of the asthmas, this is just a genetic thing. These are the before and after. This is where we're going. Now on the bottom, lower teeth, we've just bleached them and placed some bonded composite on the incisal edge. At some point, we're going to veneer the lower anterior teeth back to the bicuspids, but from a financial standpoint, that was not something we did at this phase one. You now this is the upper left, before and after upper right, incisal. This is what I do before every appointment. Every morning, I see somebody from eight in the morning until one or two in the afternoon. I was in a surgery fellowship for two years and I was certified in IV sedation. If you're gonna do these more involved cases, I encourage you to become certified in some type of sedation, even oral sedation, just because that's a long time for a patient to sit in the chair and it's, the sedation is more mental than physical. It quells their anxiety. Learn how to give painless and profound local anesthesia. You can refer to this video. So the first thing we're doing is deep cleaning. You'll remember in the pre-op photographs, he had lots of calculus on the teeth. And so the way we do deep cleaning in my office while I don't like to anesthetize all four quadrants of a patient when they're wide awake in the hygiene room, that's just a, a bad first impression of our office in dentistry. So I prefer to do the gross debridement while the patient is sedated and they're not even going to know they've been anesthetized and do the gross debridement of the teeth 
get most of the things off with an ultrasonic scaler and I'll do some hand scaling and possibly some polishing at this appointment. Then my hygienist sees them for the fine scaling and oral hygiene instruction. But I don't like to anesthetize someone's full mouth or really do much local anesthesia at all without sedation, especially at the first appointment because I want them to have a good impression of our office and dentistry in general. So this is this ultrasonic scaler. Now this is very important before we begin the case. This is the wax up. I'm not going to go into exactly what the wax up is, but basically it's a very close idea to what the final product is going to be. I don't like to begin something that I don't know how it's going to end. Now the wax up is going to be thicker facially than the final result, but I can see that the diastomas are filled in and the incisal uh, plane is correct. Now see, we've waxed them up a little bit thicker because that we're going to use the wax up for the matrix for the provisional restorations. I want the provisional restorations to be thick enough, the bisacrylate provisional restorations to be thick enough that I can handle them. If they're only half a millimeter thick, it's like working with toilet paper. They're too thin to work with, so I always wax up the case prior to veneer prep tooth preparation so that and make the matrix for the provisionals off of the wax up so the provisional restorations are thick enough to handle. So this is the preparation for the veneers. Now I break the contacts between the teeth from the mesial of the cuspid to the mesial of the other cuspid. I don't break the contacts between the cuspid and the bicuspid or the two bicuspids or the second bicuspid and the first molar. There's a reason for that. You can watch my video on the importance of wrapping and I go over why I do break the contacts between the cuspids and I don't between the bicuspids and the molar. Dr. Pascal, Magne, and Douglas devised this wrapping technique and it's very important. You'll think that the teeth are significantly prepared. The tooth doesn't know the difference. You're still in enamel and the restorations are much stronger and more aesthetic and more predict predictably seated than if you just place them on the facial surface of the teeth. Don't place veneers just on the facial. You want to include the interproximal and the incisal edge. The seating is much more precise. There are a number of reasons why you want to do that. Watch that video on wrapping and I go through all of them. Okay, so this is just a small coarse barrel diamond and I first cut the depth cuts into the teeth. These teeth are just sort of a normal yellow shade, about a B or A3. The facial reduction is only about a half a millimeter. If they were darker, you might have to reduce the fa facial a millimeter just to give the technician a greater thickness for the veneer to block out the dark. Now, what do you do in cases like this that diastomas are already present? I don't need any more space, but I need the interproximal surfaces to be in such a alignment that the veneers will draw. So if they've got a bulge, as most teeth do, you've got to remove that and make prep these teeth kind of like an upside down Dixie cup so the veneer will draw onto the tooth. So I'm continuing with this coarse barrel diamond. Now, I'm not really removing much tooth structure in approximately. I just want these surfaces to draw so we can seat the veneer. Also, it's po if possible, you'd like all the teeth to draw with the other teeth so the provisional restorations will seat. If one of the teeth didn't draw, you could seat those uh, provisional restorations separately. You could break the provisional restorations at an interproximal contact and seat them separately. Now this is a kind of a medium-sized round, round burr. And what I'm doing is cutting a lug into the facial incisal aspect of the bicuspid teeth. 
Now, this does a couple of things. Number one, it protects the occlusal surface of the provisional veneer from bruxism. Number two, it provides a seating stop. If you just prep the facial surface of that tooth, the veneer will swim or it'll move when you seat it. So you need this lug so that when you put the veneer to place, it, will, it has a stop. Now all the anterior teeth from the cuspid and the laterals and the central incisors have a stop on the incisal edge because you're prepping the incisal edge. That incisal edge is gonna be flat so that the incisal palatal line angle is 90 degrees. Then you're gonna round the incisal facial line angle and the interproximal facial line angles. But the incisal palatal line angle is flat, but that incisal edge is your stop when you're seating the veneer plus the interproximal preparations on the anterior teeth to the mesial of the cuspid. See, this is about, oh, probably a half millimeter deep, and you don't include the, the occlusal surface. It's just on the facial, and you take it to the approximately the interproximal contact. This is a flame-shaped fine diamond, and I use that for the marginal preparation. I like to place the margins of a veneer about a half millimeter to a millimeter in the sulcus on the facial. Now it's very important that you don't invade the biologic width, meaning you don't want to prep past the floor of the sulcus. You absolutely do not want to prep into the junctional epithelium. If you do, you're going to have all kinds of gingival problems. So I just want the veneer margin to be in the sulcus, and these sulcus uh, on the anterior teeth and the maxillary bicuspid teeth are normally pretty shallow, maybe a couple of millimeters. So I don't want to go more than halfway into the sulcus. Just I'm prepping just into the interproximal contact, but I'm not breaking the interproximal contact between the from cuspid to first molar. Be sure this mesial of the cuspid draws. You know, there's one direction when you're prepping that the burr cuts and when it polishes. So most of the time when I'm placing a margin, I want to go in the polishing direction of the handpiece. Now in this case, there's a diastema between the cuspid and the bicuspid. So I'm going to include the interproximal contact in this case, between the cuspid and the bicuspid. If there wasn't a diastema there, I would not include it. And watch, the, include it. And watch that video on wrapping, and I'll I tell you why. So continuing and being sure that the interproximal surfaces draw about a half millimeter to a millimeter into the sulcus. But don't invade the junctional epithelium or the attached gingiva. Now, I really like this burr for the interproximal surface preparation because it's straight. The flame-shaped diamond kind of goes like this. I like this straight side to be sure these interproximal surfaces draw. And I'm removing any bulge in the interproximal part of the tooth. You can see this cuspid had some bit of an anomaly. It was real short to start with and we have a diastema here. So in this case, I'm prepping at least halfway into the interproximal surface, cutting my depth cuts of about half a millimeter Now, what if one of these teeth, say the central incisor, was facial verted? It was out like this. If it's not 
to the point that the person needs orthodontics prior to veneers, you're going to cut that back into the arch alignment and then do the veneer preparation. So cutting it into the arch alignment doesn't count as veneer preparation. You're not prepping it for a veneer until it's back into the arch alignment. In this case, we really didn't have to do that. So these are the lugs, and you only cut them on the bicuspids, or if you're veneering a molar, you do the same thing because you're not including the occlusal surface on the bicuspids or the molars. On the cuspids and the other anterior teeth, you've got a flat incisal edge, and that's your stop for the veneer when you're seating it. This is about a half a millimeter, but with a definitive floor, so the veneer stops when you're seating it. If you, you, you never want to just prepare the facial surface of the teeth. That sounds good, but it's terrible because you don't, have a def you don't know that you've seated it correctly because it'll swim all over the place. Again, only about just part way into the interproximal contact of the bicuspids and between the second bicuspid and the first molar. Now this is showing how I prepare the incisal edges of the central incisors. I stand up and sometimes I'll tip the patient up, but I want to be sure I have a view back from the patient so I can see the pupillary line because I want the incisal edges of the centrals to be parallel to the pupillary line. So I stand in front with this occlusal reduction burr and prep those incisal edges to be sure they're parallel with the pupillary line. And remember, I want the incisal edges of the cuspids, the lateral incisors, and the central incisors to be flat. By flat, I mean the incisal palatal line angles are 90 degrees. The incisal facial and the interproximal facial line angles are rounded. But I want this to be a flat surface. Don't taco it onto the palatal. You want it to be a 90 degree angle at the incisal palatal line angle. All the studies show this is the most favorable preparation for many reasons. And I go through it in that video on wrapping. This is not original to me. Dr. Monye and Douglas did the studies and came up with this method. Sometimes dentists will ask in the comment section, do you always include the interproximal contacts? And do you always have a flat incisal surface? Yes, every time, even if it's single veneer, if it's an anterior tooth. Now, if it's between cuspids, bicuspids, or between bicuspids or bicuspids in a first molar, unless there's a diastema, I don't include the interproximal surface. So you round all the lined angles except the incisal palatal and the interproximal palatal. You want those to be 90 degrees. This that same straight burr, the 00631. Round these incisal facial line angles. The incisal edges of the central incisors are prepared so that those edges are parallel to the pupillary line. Now, what if this tooth was had a broken edge like this, or it was for some reason it was short? down to here. Would you prepare this tooth down to that short incisal edge of the adjacent central? No. In that case, you would not. You'd just make this edge parallel to the pupillary line. See, this edge is flat, flat, flat. So once you get these edges, you try to coordinate the edges of the adjacent teeth, although this was a short cuspid. So I'm not going to shorten this cuspid to that cuspid. Now, what do you worry about when you've got a short tooth like that? You worry a little bit about veneer fracture. You tell the patient, don't bite hard things on that tooth because you're going to have some lithium desilicate or whatever you fabricate the veneers from cantilevered off the edge of that tooth. So there's a greater chance of fracturing the veneer there as opposed to this one that's only going to have about a millimeter and a half of cantilevered restorative material off the incisal edge of the tooth. So I tell all of my patients, even patients without veneers, don't bite anything harder than a hamburger 
or a tuna fish sandwich with your front teeth. Veneers are as strong as natural teeth if you, if you prepare them and seed them the way I'm going to show you how to seed them. But even with natural teeth, we have two or three people a week come into our office, office with fractured and sized ledges of anterior teeth from biting something hard. Especially if they don't have a night guard and they've worn their teeth and they've got that thin incisal edge from grinding their teeth. But the angle of the upper anterior teeth is not good for biting hard things. The teeth are like this, so when you bite, you're pushing outward that way. Whereas when you bite on posterior teeth, you chew something, you're chewing along the long axis of the teeth. So when you bite on front teeth, it's like having a pane of glass buried in the floor. If you hit it on the, the end, it's solid, but if you hit it from the side, you're more likely to fracture it. So the posterior teeth are like you're hitting it on the end, driving it into the floor. The an upper anterior teeth are like you're hitting it on the side. So that's a couple of things you can tell all your patients is don't bite anything harder than a hamburger or a tuna fish sandwich with your front teeth. The other thing is when you're chewing food, the first few chews of any bite, chew softly in case there's a rock or a bone in the beans or the rice, you don't fracture the tooth. So the first few chews, chew very softly and find that little piece of rock or bone before you chomp down on it and they fracture a tooth. So the, you can see everything draws. Now this is sent to the laboratory and this confirms the face bone mounting for the technician. The technician can see that the incisal edges of the central incisors are parallel to the pupillary line. So he can confirm that the models of the prepared teeth mounted on the articulator are correct, that somebody hadn't bumped the face bow and it's off. He can, he can see that this is what the preparations look like in relation to the pupillary line. The pupillary line represents the horizon or the floor or the lab bench. So this is the, wax, this is the waxed up model and this is the polyvinyl siloxane matrix fabricated on the waxed up model for the provisional bisacrylate restorations. All right, so here's the wax up again. Watch that video. So you wet the prepared teeth thoroughly and leave the water on the teeth then squirt the bisacrylate into the matrix. Be sure you keep, keep the tip of the bisacrylate gun on the, the incisal surface of the matrix so that no air bubbles develop. You don't want to just squirt it in there. You want to keep the tip rubbing against the bottom of the matrix. See, I'm rubbing it in there. Then wet the teeth, put it in place. Now, when you make fabricate this matrix, it's very important that the matrix extend onto the palate. Because if you've prepared all the anterior teeth and you've reduced the incisal and you push there, the matrix will seat too much and you won't have any bisacrylate material on the incisal edges of the anterior teeth. If the matrix, ex matrix extends onto the palate, you can push on the palate and the palate acts like a stop for the matrix. Then squirt a little bit of the bisacrylate on the patient's bib so you can tell when it's set. Then just work it off. There it is. Then I'm gonna place cord only on the facial. Now this is zero, zero, ginger plane, non-impregnated uh, cord. And I'm only gonna place it on the facial to the facial interproximal line angle. You don't want to place it through the interproximal contact because if you put a cord here and a cord here, you may strangulate that papilla. And if you do, you could lose it. So only on the facial. And this is a good instrument to place it with. See, it ends right there. And angle this instrument toward the tooth when you're placing the cord. And this is block out material because we're going to be taking an impression with polyether impression material in a custom tray. It's very important that you use a custom tray when you're using polyether or polyvinyl siloxane. If you don't, you'll get blibs and voids in the impression. Plus that 
custom tray really forces that material into the sulcus to capture those margins. Now, some of you may use scanners. I still like uh, polyether with custom tray, and then I chase that with a reversible hydrocolloid impression because I feel like it's easier for me in my hands to capture subgingival margins with polyether with custom tray because that custom tray, as I said, forces that material when you remove this cord down into those sulcus and captures those margins. It's a little trickier with a scanner to capture subgingival margins. You have to blow air and you know, it's not that it can't be done. It's just I've done it this way so long and it works. I like it. So this is block out material because polyether is pretty stiff and you want to block out between the teeth that have not been prepared so it doesn't lock in to those interproximal contacts and place it on the facial and the palatal. And here's the cord placed. See the preps are all in the arch alignment. Now this is the custom tray. You can look that video up on YouTube. This is the body material. Be sure you keep the tip of the dispenser in the material so you don't capture any air bubbles. Then we're going to squirt the wash material directly on the unset body material, which is in the custom tray. Now it's important that you make these custom trays within a day of when you're going to use them. If you make the custom tray too far ahead of time, the body material won't adhere to the custom tray material. And just rinse the teeth real well. I like polyether and reversible hydrocolloid because they are hydrophilic. They like water, whereas polyvinylsiloxane is hydrophobic. It does not like water. So you can have a wet tooth, and the polyether is fine with that. You know, just rinse the teeth real well. If there's even a little bit of bleeding, as long as it's not scabbed or set blood, that's okay. If it's you want to rinse everything off so there's not anything set on the teeth, and the polyether is fine with that because it's hydrophilic, it likes water. So I dampen the teeth before I take my impression. You can see how crisp and accurate those margins are. Then I chase it with a reversible hydrocolloid impression. It sets up when, when cold water runs through the channels that connect to the tray. The trays have channels in them, and then it gets soft again if you heat it up. So you put it in warm, and then you the channels of cold water run through the tray and make it set, and it's deadly accurate. This is a hydrocolloid, but to use hydrocolloid, you've got to have these channeled trays and a hose set up to your optor chair. But they're very accurate. You can see how crisp those margin margins are. Why do I take two impressions? In case there is any question about a something on the polyether impression, we've got another model to refer to to check it. The other thing is I always use a solid model to perfect the interproximal contacts and the reversible hydrocolloid model is very good for that. Now the thing about a reversible hydrocolloid impression, you have to pour it within a couple of hours of taking it. A polyether impression you can pour two weeks later. And a polyether impression will travel. You have to pour a reversible hydrocolloid impression in your office. So again, this goes to the laboratory technician so he can confirm the face bone mounting. I'd like the incisal edges of the centrals to be parallel to a line drawn between the pupils, which represents the floor, the horizon, and the tabletop. So when the technician sees the prep model mounted on an articulator, he can confirm that that mounted model is the same as the teeth in the mouth. I'm removing these provisional restorations. And if there's any void in a margin or anywhere else on the provisional, use flowable composite to repair it. Then I like a flame-shaped diamond, lots of water in the polishing direction, which is this direction, just to perfect those margins. Then I'm going to take a face bow. This wax part could be in any direction, depending on the 
incisal occlusal plane of the teeth, this bar should be parallel to the pupillary line. Then I'm going to place unfilled resin or adhesive only in the trimmed provisional restorations. There's no primer in this. I use Scotch Bond multi-purpose adhesive. You dry the teeth off. Don't etch them. Just dry them off. Now, occasionally, the bicuspids, if you have this many teeth prepared, will flare out like a starch shirt. If that occurs, cut the provisionals between the cuspids and the laterals and seat it in three parts. Cuspid through second by cuspid and then lateral to lateral and then cuspid through second by cuspid if they flare out when they're on the teeth during the trying. I'm wiping the adhesive on the teeth just as a glaze and then blow the excess off with, as you put my fingers between the cuspids and the bicuspids to hold it to place. I'm going to take my air syringe and blow the excess adhesive onto a two by two that I've placed in the mouth. Then I'm going to continue to hold it as my assistant cures between each two provisional restorations for 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. And then once she's cured on the palatal, I'm going to remove my fingers and she's going to come back and cure each provisional from the facial for 20 seconds. Now that's not a magic number. That's just the way we do it. Palo first, when she's curing the palo, I'm going to have my finger here between the cuspid and bicuspid on each side, holding it to place. And she's going to cure from the palo first, 20 seconds between each two provisional restorations. Then she's, I'm going to remove my fingers because the adhesive is pretty well set and she's going to cure every restoration 20 seconds from the facial and go back and cure some more on the palatal also. Then these Shofu rubber wheels are fabulous for occlusal adjustment because they don't cut the teeth but they do cut the provisional restoration. So you always have that little ledge of provisional restoration on the facial. These are perfect because they'll remove that, but they don't cut the teeth. They don't remove tooth structure. I'm going to check it with articulating paper, and I don't want any contact on the provisional restorations. And once they're seated, I'm going to come back with this flame-shaped diamond, lots of water on a high-speed handpiece, and I'm going to go in the polishing direction. If I'm pulling the hand piece this way, it's cutting. If I'm going that way, it's polishing. So I'm going to primarily go in the polishing direction and just smooth the margin of the provisional, not touching the tooth. Then come back and fine tune the, the palatal surface. Then I'm going to check the incisal plane of the provisional restorations because I'm going to send an impression of the provisionals and a photograph of the provisionals with the lips retracted so it shows the pupillary line and I'm going to say to the technician the incisal plane of the provisionals is good. You can use some artistic creativity but basically they're aligned correctly but I'm going to stand up and stand in front of the patient to adjust the incisal plane. If you do it while they're laid back and you're on the side it's very difficult to get that incisal plane perfect. So there's the provisionals. I'm going to send this to the technician so he can see the relationship of the incisal plane of the provisional restorations to the pupillary line. And he can use these provi the provisional model for a custom incisal guide tray or a polyvinyl siloxane matrix as a guide for the incisal plane of the final restoration. So this goes to the technician too. These are the provisionals in place. Now the patient had a, a broken tooth that was painful over here. So I'm first measuring the length with my application on the computer. You see it's about 15 millimeters. The distal canal is about 15 millimeters. The mesial is about 16 and a half. See the tooth's broken down. I'm going to enter the pulp chamber with this coarse football diamond. 
be sure you've got plenty of access opening so you're filing the canals in a direct line. You don't want to be curving like this. You're more prone to separate a file. You want direct access. Dr. Alex Flory, an internationally known endodontist in Dallas, taught the endo course at my teaching center in Dallas for many, many years. And that's this. a lot of this information is his. He brought real-world endo, the Brasler system, with him to the center. And it's a fabulous rotary system. So this is just a slow-speed round burr to open up the canal. Now, this is the real-world endo system. These are scout files, and they're fabulous for finding little tiny canals. And they're very flexible, and I've never separated a scout file, but they're great for finding little bitty canals. Then you follow, I follow that with hand files. I like Hedstrom. A lot of people use K, K files, and this is a size 10, and you clean that out really well. I irrigate with three parts water, one part sodium hypochlorite. A lot of endodontists use straight sodium hypochlorite. I've had very good luck with three parts water, one part sodium hypochlorite, and there's just not the risk if something significant went through the, the apex of the, of the tooth. Then you can follow that with either the four rotary file system or this is a single file system that you can do the entire endodontic procedure with this. But according to Dr. Flory and other endodontists, the main thing with a, a root canal or an endodontic procedure is the cleaning of the canals and the irrigation. That's the main thing. The filling of the canals is important, but the primary part is the filing of the canals and the irrigation. Now, the reason you start with a scalp file, then the hand file, is you want to clean that canal out pretty thoroughly before you start using rotary files. Now, I've never separated this rotary file, the EJ02, but I have separated a few of these rotary files. If you're going to separate a file, it's probably going to be a larger file, and this is called the crown down system. You start with a larger file and then go down to the smaller files. I personally start with this largest file. This is the medium. It goes 25, 30, 35, 40. I'll start with this and create an access opening, and this is not going to go to depth. Then I'll file the depth with my hand file and clean that out really well and irrigate it real well. That way, if it's cleaned and irrigated, if you should separate a file, it's not the end of the world, and you probably don't have to have somebody remove that file. There's some risk to the tooth if you remove a separated file you know, of perforation. And so if you've cleaned it out and irrigated it real well, this separated file becomes like a silver point that was the only thing dentists had to fill canals with years ago. I'm not suggesting you become sloppy and you don't want to put pressure with the rotary files, but it, if it happened, it's not life and death. If you've cleaned that canal out to depth with a hand file and irrigated it well before you have a separated rotary file. So I really like these, and I'll go with the, hand, the scalp file, then the 10 Hedstrom, clean it out and irrigate it real well with the three parts water, one part sodium hypochlorite, and then start with this file. I use the medium files from 25 to 40, probably 90 plus percent of the time. They've also got a grouping of four for larger files like maxillary uh, anterior teeth, and they've got a grouping for smaller files, for little teeny weeny files. So I'll start with this one, and normally I go from this one to this one and then work my way through here if I can go to depth with this. Now, what if you can't go to depth with a 25? I'm going to go back with my hand file and irrigate. Be sure the canal is lubricated before you're filing and irrigate it and lubricate it. Don't squirt the irrigation 
in the canal with force, you squirt it into the pulp chamber and let the phial take it down the canal for lubrication. And I'm gonna open it up until I can go to depth with this canal, I may with this file. I may go to this file next and just go a little bit deeper, opening it up without any pressure, just barely put it in the canal and then pull up. You don't want to push into the canal until I can go to depth with this rotary file. Then once I can go to depth with this one, I'm going to follow with this one and then this one and then this one. And I may not be able to go to depth with one of these. I may only go to depth with this one. And I'm going to irrigate between each rotary file. So once I establish the rotary file that goes to depth, I'm going to use either that size gutta percha cone or gutta percha cone a size smaller as my master cone. So I'm opening the occlusal part of the canal with my 40 rotary file. Then this is the headstrom number 10, and I've got the rubber stop on to, to the depth I've measured on the applicator. So this is going within one millimeter of the apex of the tooth. You'd like to be at half a millimeter. So I know if I'm at one millimeter, I need to go about a half millimeter deeper or further into the canal. That's at 17. Then I'm going to do, continue to file with my hand file. And this is the mesial buckle. And it also is at one millimeter, one millimeter from the apex. So you'd like to be a half millimeter from the apex. So I need to go, need, know I need to go a little bit deeper or further into the tooth. And so this is the mesial lingual canal. And it's also a millimeter from the apex. So that's good. I'm going to open up the coronal part of the canals a little bit more and then go a little bit further into the canals. File until I, I go a half millimeter deeper in the, into the canal. And you can see I've got the stopper on there that marks my measured penetration into the canal. Then I'm, now I'm with the red file, which is the 25, irrigating with my three parts water, uh, one part sodium hypochloride. This is the green file, which is the 35, and I don't expect it to go to depth. I'm just opening up the coronal part. See, I'm not pushing. I'm just letting it pull itself into the canal. And I'm trying to open up the coronal part so I can go to depth with one of the smaller rotary files. This is the blue one. This is the 30. And I'm not pushing. I'm just letting it pull itself into the canal. Very important you irrigate with the sodium hypochlorite. This is just a 10 gauge syringe and I'm just squirting it into the pulp chamber of the canal. I'm not putting any pressure uh, into the canals themselves. I'll let the rotary file carry it into the canals. Okay, this is the 25 again. See, that goes to depth because I've opened up the coronal part. This is the, the foundation of the real world endo system. You open up the coronal part so it's easier to get go to depth with the smaller rotary files. So this is the 30 rotary file. I'm letting it pull itself into the canal. So these are the depths. All right, this is the 35. And I'll just see if it goes to depth. If it doesn't go to depth, then that means we're gonna use the 30 go to percha cone. Why do you want the coronal part of the canal to be opened up? Number one, it holds the sodium hypochlorite like it's in a little pool or glass. And number two, it allows the smaller files to go to depth because they're not being bound by the coronal part of the canal. So we're going to take our trial file. You see these are right on the money. I'm going to irrigate them again. And then I'm going to irrigate them with local anesthesia with a 30 gauge syringe. Now the local anesthesia has nothing to do with anything. It just so happens that you can, it's easy to irrigate with it because it fits into this syringe. The 30 gauge needle is the key. And I'm not putting it into the canal, I'm just putting it at the coronal part of the canal to irrigate out any little bits of debris or any remaining sodium hypochlorite. 
Uh, it's just for irrigation. The local anesthesia has nothing to do with it. If there was water in the car fuel, that would be just fine. I'm just irrigating out the remaining uh, sodium hypochlorite from the canal. And we're going to dry them with paper points. And I use two paper points. For, uh, first, I'll blow a little air to get the bulk of the water out of the tooth. And then I'll usually dry each canal with two paper points. Now, this is the BC sealer. You don't squirt it into the canal forcibly. You just squirt it into the coronal part of each canal. And then just place, move the master cone up and down to coat the canal. Then you're going to use this warmer to cut the gutta percha cone off. Then I was, again, just squirting it into the coronal part of the canal. Some endodontists put the sealer on the gutta percha cone itself. I find it easier to squirt it just into the coronal part of the canal. Move it up and down to coat the canal. Use the sealer, cut it off at the tooth level. And then I'm going to plug it just a little bit. Then I like to come back with the sealer and squirt that over the coronal part of the filled canal because it just looks better on a radiograph. You don't have any voids in here. Sometimes when you put the IRM buildup in, there's a little void right at the coronal part of the canal. So this eliminates that most of the time. But this is just for aesthetics on the radiograph. Then I'm placing IRM, and you want to mix this thick. You can look up in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com the video on how to make IRM. And this is just easy. It's a great build-up material. It doesn't affect cement set. It's set completely by the time you place the crown. So the IRM doesn't affect the cement, the setting of the cement. This is a chamfer, fine chamfer diamond. I'm using that for the margin. Since this tooth is not in the aesthetic zone, there's no reason to prep subgingivally. Then you've got a big super bulge on this tooth. So if you remove all that super bulge to prepare subgingivally, you've removed a lot of tooth structure unnecessarily. If you just prep to the cemento enamel junction, which is in the midst of that super bulge, you're preserving all that tooth structure. And especially if you've had a root canal procedure on a tooth, the tooth will become a little more brittle over time. You want to preserve as much tooth structure as you can. That's why I'm not a real fan of full crowns on anterior teeth if you don't have to place a crown. I'd rather place a veneer and preserve that tooth structure, especially if endodontics has been done on the tooth. If you don't have to place a crown or a veneer, on an anterior tooth, that's even better because the tooth will become more brittle over time and it's more prone to fracture if you remove tooth structure for a crown or a veneer in addition to the root canal. I'm probably a millimeter from the gingival margin and just fine tuning it with that flame shaped diamond. Since the tooth is short, I'm going to gain a little more retention internally by removing some of the buildup material so that I've got part of the preparation in the center part of the tooth. And I've let the IRM get hard, and I'm just removing that. I want a little draw on those the interproximal part. Now here's the endodontics before and after. And I'm going to place a provisional restoration on that tooth. It's a polyvinyl siloxane matrix. Wet the tooth and squirt the bisacrylate directly on the tooth and place it in the matrix. I squirt it on the tooth to be sure I capture the interproximal parts of the preparation. You want to include at least one tooth on either side of the prepared tooth. And then squirt this little blib on the patient's bib so you can tell when the material is set up. Rinse it, and I'm going to take two reversible hydrocolloid impressions since it's a single tooth. I don't take a polyether with custom tray. Usually, if it's just a single tooth, I take a reversible hydrocolloid. I take two reversible hydrocolloids because it's less expensive and it's, it's less trouble, and it's deadly accurate. 
two or more crowns or veneers, I take a polyether and a reversible hydrocolloid. If it's a single crown or a single veneer, I take a full arch reversible hydrocolloid and either another full arch or a half tray. Usually I'll take just a half tray reversible hydrocolloid for the second impression. Again, if it's just a single crown or veneer. I'm adjusting the provisional restoration with this acrylic burr. And since the tooth has had endodontics, I want it to be just a little bit out of occlusion or it might be uncomfortable. It's adjusting the occlusion. I'm going to seat it with this temporary cement, which I found to be very, uh, very effective for crowns. Now I'm going to go ahead and floss it with waxed floss before the provisional cement is set. I do the same thing with the final crown. I floss with waxed floss before the temp provisional cement or the permanent cement set so it doesn't set up in the interproximal area. I don't remove any excess cement though until it is set completely. Not rock hard, but it's just set, kind of like crunchy snow. Now I'm going to take an occlusal registration record for a night guard with the patient's uh, open two millimeters between the second molar teeth. And we're going to go ahead and fabricate the shell for the night guard before the patient comes back. And then we'll reline the night guard when we seat the, the final veneers. I like fabricating night guards in my office so I can fabricate the shell and reline them when we seat the permanent restorations so I don't have to take an impression and send it to a lab and wait for it to come back. So these are the final restorations. This is where we're going. Okay, that's the end of that part. We'll continue with the final episode, seating the veneers, seating the crown, and seating, relining and seating the night guard. That's dentistry master classes. These techniques work and they work every time. Hello, this is part two of this case involving veneers on the maxillary anterior teeth and bicuspids, endodontics and a crown on the lower left first molar, seating and, and relining a night guard during the veneer seating appointment and then bonding the incisal edges of the lower anterior teeth. So this is where we're going before and after. When I'm veneering maxillary anterior teeth, I pay no attention to the shade of the lower anterior teeth. I'll say that again. When I'm veneering maxillary anterior teeth, if I'm doing enough teeth that I can change the shade, i.e. I'm extending the veneers back to the first or second bicuspid, I don't pay much attention to the shade of the lower anterior teeth. Why not? For one reason, when you smile, you see the maxillary anterior teeth. You only see normally about the top quarter of the lower anterior teeth. The other reason is, in so many cases, if someone's veneering their maxillary anterior teeth, they will come back and veneer the lower anterior teeth. So we don't want to be stuck with a shade that we weren't happy with to begin with. Okay, so this is him before and after. His arch alignment was pretty good to begin with. These are the provisional restorations. So he's been in these for about a month. This is the lips in repose. You always want some tooth display with lips in repose. Now he's got a moderately arched lip. You can look up lip position in relation to incisal plane in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com. And I talk about the three different types of lips, the flat, the moderately arched, and the maximally arched in relation to incisal plane. Remember, you always want the incisal plane to basically mimic the, mimic the lower lip and be in the shape of a banana or a quarter moon. You want the centrals to be the longest teeth. Watch the video on fundamentals of aesthetics. Now this is such an important part of practice. And it seems like a, don a lot of dentists don't pay that much attention to it. If you can give a patient basically painless local anesthesia that is also profound, you know how to really anesthetize a tooth. A patient will, you know, they will be afraid of dentistry 
If you perform a procedure like a crown prep or endodontics or extract a tooth and they can feel it. So if you'll follow these techniques, how to apply a painless and profound local anesthetic, you will have some patience for life. This is a 30 gauge needle beginning with sit and nest. All right, so once everything's anesthetized, I'm going to cut between each of the provisional veneers with this mosquito diamond. Now, I'm not going to cut between the provisionals from cuspid to second by cuspid. I did break the uh, interproximal contact in these cases because they had a diastema, but I didn't break it very much, so I don't want to cut the tooth. So I'm probably going to take those off in one piece, yeah. And you just torque it with some type of elevator, and they'll come right off. Put a two-by-two two in the mouth so you don't have a patient swallow one or aspirate one. And once I remove the provisional restorations, I'm going to pumice the preparations. Remove any little bits of adhesive that may be on there. Now, if I have gingival bleeding, I'm not worried about that because I know how to control gingival bleeding. I've got a video on that, but I'm going to show you how to do it here in a minute. Now, I'm scrubbing those teeth with isopropyl alcohol. If the gingiva bleeds, that's okay. Be sure all little bits of adhesive are off the teeth. And this is the tooth, the molar tooth we performed endodontics in a crown. There's the crown. I'm going to try that in first. And you use the solid model to perfect the interproximal contact. And I'm going to check that with unwaxed floss. My assistant's putting her finger on the crown to hold it down as I check the interproximal contacts. That was very good. Checking the margins with an explorer. Now, if you've got any question, you take a radiograph of the margin of the crown. Then these are the the veneers on the maxillary anterior teeth and bicuspids. These are Emax or lithium desilicate. I'm going to use a solid model. This is the dye model for actually fabrication of the veneers, but we're going to use this solid model to perfect the interproximal contact. And you'll basically probably never have to adjust an interproximal contact again if you use this method. There are few things in life as a dentist worse than to be seating several veneers or crowns and have a tight interproximal contact. Have a few tight ones because you're not sure exactly where it is and you're going to end up over adjusting one of the interproximal contacts probably. If you use the solid model technique, you, you really should never inter, uh, have to adjust an interproximal contact. So I'm going to try the veneers on the solid model, and then I'm going to try them on the teeth. Now, I'm not worried about the bleeding at all. I'm going to control that here in a minute. See, with the bicuspids, I've got to stop because I've got that lug caught, cut into the facial occlusal surface. It doesn't actually extend onto the occlusal. It's just in the facial, so when I seat it, it has a stop. If you've only prepared the facial, if the veneer is only on the facial, that's a nightmare because it's going to swim. It's not going to seat distinctly. I'm going to try them in. Be sure you put a two-by-two two in the mouth. Then we're going to wipe them with isopropyl alcohol. Now, before this is done, these lithium desilicate or Emax veneers have been treated. And so now that we're taking them out of the mouth, we're just going to wipe them with isopropyl alcohol and dry them off. And then use this red rope wax as a transfer. I'm going to put just a little bit of Vaseline on the interproximal contacts to make it easier to remove the looting composite. This is the crown. This transfer method is so nice because sometimes it's hard to get your fingers back in the back of the mouth. And it's just very precise. The placement's very precise. It's very easy to make just red rope wax on the tip of a cotton tip applicator. Now, this is the hemostatic control as we etch the teeth. And I'm going to etch three to four teeth at a time. See how this is scabbed? 
I found this by accident when I was etching teeth, that it scabs any bleeding area. Now, when you rinse it off, it's very important that you rinse it off with a water bottle with ice cold water. Don't rinse it with your air water syringe. If you do, you'll elicit bleeding again. Now, rinse it with ice cold water in this water bottle and see how that stops the bleeding. Now, I want to leave this, if there's any bleeding, I want to leave the etch on the tooth and especially on the bleeding area for 45 seconds. Now, what if you rinse off the 38% uh, phosphoric acid and there's still a little bleeding in an area? Etch it again and leave it for another 45 seconds. It will not damage the gingival tissue. I've been doing this for many, many years and it does not damage the gingival tissue. So now I'm going to etch the four anterior teeth and I'm going to leave this on for 45 seconds to a minute. Rinse it with the ice cold water. Now what happens if you get blood underneath the veneer? You're going to have a dark spot in the veneer and you'll end up having to redo the veneer. So you don't want that to happen. Plus it would interfere with the bonding of the veneer to the tooth. So now the final three, rinse with ice cold water. Then if I've got any little bit of bleeding, I'm going to squirt this back on that area for 45 seconds. Now, what if you still had bleeding? What if somebody was taking blood thinner and they still had bleeding? You might have to inject the gum, that papilla, papillary area, with lidocaine 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. But rarely do I have to do that. It would only be if somebody was taking a blood thinner and... You just couldn't get the bleeding to stop, but I can't remember that ever happening. Okay, so I've dried the veneers and I've put the primer adhesive into the veneer. Put a lot of it in there and then blow it off. Now, I like to turn the veneer down this way where the incisal part is away and I'm actually blowing into the incisal part to be sure there's not any pooling of the primer adhesive in the incisal part of the tooth side of the veneer. So you want to blow all that off. This is getting rid of the acetone carrier. Remember the acetone carries the primer into the dentinal tubules. But it's very important that you get rid of the acetone because it can affect the bond strength. So blow it off until nothing wiggles. Plenty of adhe primer adhesive on there after you've blown it off. Now I've dabbed the teeth with a two by two. The primer adhesive likes dampness. The primer is attracted to water. It's hydrophilic. So you don't have to blow them dead dry. Just kind of dab them off with a two by two. You don't want to elicit bleeding again and pile this primer adhesive on the teeth thickly. Just put it on there thick and then you're going to blow it off again to get rid of the, the acetone carrier. Load it up and then blow it onto a two by two. So nothing wiggles on the veneer or on the tooth. And really load it up till you're sure the surface of the tooth is completely covered. Pop that floss through the cusp by cuspids because I haven't prepared all the way through the interproximal contact. Then I use, if I'm doing this many teeth, I generally use B0.5 Rely-X veneer. I've used 3M Rely-X for years and years and years. It's very strong, works beautifully for me. And I always put them all on at the same time. Why? If you put them on one at a time, that to me is crazy because you've got to remove the X and you cure it. You put them on one at a time. You've got to remove that excess cement before you put the adjacent veneers on. Well, there's a very good chance removing that excess cement is going to elicit bleeding of the gums. You're probably going to touch the gums. The other thing is, if you put them all on at the same time and you try them in ahead of time, you know they fit ideally and the interproximal contacts are correct. So I don't want them to swim just a little bit and now I'm putting this one on and it doesn't go down. So I like to put them on all at the same time. Now, before I put them on, I turn the lights off in the room and I have only the overhead light on and I turn it down toward the patient's toes so there's just a light glow on the mouth because you don't want the light 
in the room or in the overhead light to cause the, the cement to set up prematurely. Put it into place, and this is two cotton tip applicators, just being sure that everything's aligned. Check them from the incisal edge, incisal plane. You've already tried them in, so you know they fit. And I go back each time. You don't have any hurry because they're not going to cure until you cure them with the curing light. They're not going to set up. So you've got all the time in the world to go back and push them to place, be sure everything fits. I'm checking to be sure that they're completely seated. I'm going to pop the floss between those and just, this is wax floss, and just pull them through. Now, you don't have to do that, but it makes the cleanup easier. I'm not removing the excess cement until it's set. The bicuspids are always the trickiest to seat. You don't ever want to remove the excess looting composite excess looting cement from a crown or veneer until it has initial set, kind of like crunchy snow, so it'll peel off. There's always a micro gap between a laboratory fabricated restoration of veneer or crown and the tooth. Just a little micro gap. It may be 25 microns. If it's a good veneer or a good crown, it's about 25 microns. Well, bacteria is eight microns. So if you wipe away this is very important. If you wipe away that excess cement before it has, has initially set, so it breaks off or peels off and doesn't wipe off, you're going to get some suck back in that micro gap and you're going to have a void in the micro gap. Well, bacteria can get into that void and cause sensitivity, staining, gingival irritation, all those things. Whereas if you peel off the excess or polish it off, you've got a solid space like a sandwich between the veneer and the restoration. So bottom line, don't wipe off the excess looting composite. Peel it off or polish it off. Once I've seeded all the veneers, I'm going to cure it initially with a curing light. Not all the way. But I'm going to hit the light on the ling paddle and go a thousand and one, a thousand and stop. Then I'm going to hit it on the facial, go a thousand and one, a thousand and stop. That fast will cure the veneers initially so you can peel off the excess looting deposit. This is on the facial, just that little bit, and that's enough, and it'll peel right off. I had some issue with that cuspid, so I took that one off, cleaned it, and seated it separately. Then I'm going to go back and cure these 60 seconds on each side, going through the same process again. I don't know that I've ever had this happen, but something was, that tooth was kind of oddly shaped, and I had a little trouble with the seating of that veneer. But if you do, don't panic. Just take that off and seat it again. But I think this is the only time I can ever remember having trouble with a veneer seating. It had something to do with the angle of the tooth. And what if you don't, if you can't floss between some veneers? Sometimes that's going to happen. You're going to come back with this 12 fluted carbide burr and just polish in between the restorations. And it's normally the bicuspids where you haven't broken the contact. And it's not a big deal. You just polish between and remove that little bit of looting composite that's set up in the interproximal contact. Just light pressure. 
I'm going to cure these 60 seconds on both sides after we've initially removed the excess composite. And then you can take the flat end of this amalgam carver and rub that on the facial and that will remove any adhesive or any looting composite that's on the facial. And this is a flame shaped carbide burr. So once I've flossed them and removed most of the excess, just peeled off that excess looting composite, I'm going to cure with two curing lights on the facial and the palo for 60 seconds and then come back and polish. And removing any excess looting composite. Just checking those contacts. This is waxed floss I'm checking those with. The gums will be pretty irritated after all this polishing and flossing. Don't worry about that. And I'm going to place the shell of the night guard. And I want only the anterior teeth to contact. And I'm going to reline this shell is made of acrylic. And I've cut these retention holes in the, the shell. I'm going to reline it with bisacrylate. The holes are just to give it a little more mechanical retention. Wet the teeth thoroughly. And put, you can put a little Vaseline if there's on the teeth also if you want to. And then once it has just beginning to set, come back with the back side of a scaler and remove the uh, acrylic bisacrylate that's seeped out. Then you're going to polish that. This is the crown. I'm going to wipe it with isopropyl alcohol. Since it's had endodontics, I don't have to come back with tubelicid. Keep it dry, use the carrier, put that to place flossy interproximal contact so the cement doesn't set up in the interproximal. Don't remove the excess looting composite. And while that's setting up, come back and do the final polishing on the veneers. A little looting composite and the interproximal contacts. So I'm removing that so I can floss. Then finalizing the palatal surface with this large chamfer diamond. A lot of water, and I don't want to feel any edge with my explorer. And I'm going to take this 12 fluted carbide burr and go around every margin real lightly and just polish those margins. Be sure there's not any excess looting composite at the margins. Check the occlusion. And once the occlusion is right and the, everything is polished with the, the fine diamond burrs, I'm going to come back with the Shofu wheels and polish everything real well. So it's just smooth, smooth, smooth. And I like to have my assistant drip water while I'm polishing with the Shofu rubber wheels. Check the occlusion again. Now I'm going to bond the incisal, the chipped incisal edges of the lower anterior teeth. You take this tiniest carbide round burr about a number one half and just make a little tiny indentation in the part of the tooth where the chip or the wear has occurred into the dentin. If you place 
the composite just on the flat surface of the tooth, the patient's going to chip it off. This protects the composite restoration. Many times that dentinal area is dark and it's unesthetic. And so you can put a light composite in there and make it much more aesthetic and get rid of the serrated part of the tooth. You can't make the tooth any longer with bonded composite, but you can make it smooth. In other words, I can't make this tooth this long with bonded composite. If I do, the patient's going to break it off because that's in their grinding envelope of function but you can make it smooth. So this tooth, I can't make this composite any longer than this or this one any longer than this. I can't bring it up to here, but I can make that serrated edge smooth. Just barely going into the tooth with this very tiny carbide round burr. Now, if this patient doesn't wear a night guard when they're sleeping, they're gonna do the same thing to the composite. I'm etching with 38% phosphoric acid, and I'll probably etch for about 30 seconds, then suction it off, then rinse it. We're not worried about bleeding. Then put a 2x2 two two in the mouth to protect the area from the patient's tongue or saliva or breath. Then cure the, with direct composites, always cure the unfilled resin or the primer adhesive after you've blown it off prior to placing the filled resin. And you only need to cure the unfilled resin for about five seconds. And this is flowable composite. The night guard is so important with any anterior restorations. And I'm going to cure those for 60 seconds per restoration. I'm going to cure the unfilled resin or the primer adhesive for about five seconds. Then I'm going to cure the filled resin or the composite for uh, 60 seconds. This is a show food disc, very good for polishing. And then this is a 12 fluted carbide burr, also very good for polishing. So see, I can't make these teeth, I can't increase the length of the teeth. I can only make the composite as long as the longest part of the tooth in that area. Now I'm adjusting the night guard, I call this an investment protector. If a patient says they don't want to wear a night guard, which barely happens but if they said that, I say, thank you very much. You're like an annuity plan for this practice because look what you did to your teeth. You'll do the same thing to your restorations. You know, the anterior teeth, those are the people that could fracture a veneer. Remember, anything that happens to a tooth could happen to a veneer. I don't expect a veneer to come off a tooth but you can break a veneer just like you break a natural tooth. So checking the occlusion, I only want the patient to contact on the anterior teeth. You can watch Fundamentals of Occlusion video in the library. So I'm checking the incisal edges of the anterior teeth with me sitting up in front of the patient. So I've got a direct view at his face with his pupillary line parallel to the floor. And just see what the incisal plane looks like. Don't check all that with him laid back and you at the side. You can't get it right. Sit him up so he's looking straight at you and that's you can adjust the incisal plane. Then you can come back and fine tune it with him laying back. So this is the final restorations. This is after the restorations have been in the mouth for a week. See the gingival tissue recovers perfectly. That's dentistrymasterclasses.com. These techniques work, and they work every time.